so good to see all of you tonight. We are beginning a, a new series. It's a, it's a brief one. It's uh, only four parts. And then in August, I think it's five parts, four or five parts of prayer. Um, so we're, we've got a couple of short series, but, but power packed, I hope. We're going to be talking about the, um, the armor of God, as Pastor Justin said. This look at the armor is, is not heavy on um, theological posturing. We've got a lesson on that. But it is heavy on, on doing um, the warfare that the armor of God equips us to be able to do. We, we're going to talk tonight about general themes. There are four things. Oh, and don't panic at the size of your notes. We gave you all the notes uh, for the month because I've, I've got several, um, it's like traveling on the interstate. There's several exits you can take. So uh, I thought it might be good for you to just have all the notes. You can bring those each week and if you forget them, we'll have other copies here. But tonight we're talking about uh, four general themes. Uh, I think these are four themes that you need to understand if you're going to really be able to grasp the idea of spiritual warfare um, in, in relation to the armor of God. Um, secondly, next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about a daily routine. What does the armor of God look like uh, in our daily routine? There are uh, theologians that take the position that the armor of God is just for defensive purposes. Um, there, there are some misconceptions about armor, you know, that uh, um, some say it's only when we're under attack. But there are others that say, no, it's for aggressive warfare. It's for us to, to move forward because Jesus said that uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, somebody says, you know, well, yeah, and then there's only armor for the front, so it's not defensive. You're not covered in the back. Well, when you talk about arm, you know, when you're talking about the armor of God, it, it, if you're talking about Roman armor, it, for the breastplate, for instance, covered the back as well. So sometimes we're facing the enemy. Sometimes we're moving to a position to hide ourselves in the Lord, but either way we're covered. And I want to say this, um, Two, there are two dynamics about the armor of God. We'll talk about that later. Um, uh, generally, theologians and commentaries say that as Paul wrote this, he was thinking of you know, a Roman soldier that had been guarding him. And it's based on the Roman armor. But it might be based on the armor described in the book of Isaiah, which is the Lord's armor. But we'll talk about that distinction when we get into it a little bit. But uh, we want to talk about what using the armor of God looks like on a daily routine. Uh, the third week, we want to talk about uh, the idea of what it means to use the armor of God and to, uh, and to do spiritual warfare as you are led and filled by the Spirit. As Paul talked about the armor of God, he ended that session by talking about all of this works as we are filled with the Spirit. So it's not just the armor, it's the impacting power of the Holy Spirit. And then the last session, we want to talk about how to have a good fight. Um, what does it look like to fight every day and win the battle using the armor of God? I want to read two passages tonight, one from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament. <clears throat> the first is illustrative of the armor. The second is, uh, is an illustration of the battle. Let's read the very familiar passage from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Um, I, I'm going to interrupt myself right here and recommend a book to you. Um, it's a very controversial book. Um, when I first introduced it to the church, um, people literally lined up to give their opinion. And some literally said, this is the best book that's ever been written on spiritual warfare. 
And uh, others said, this is blasphemy. This is not reflecting uh, spiritual warfare well. And um, the name of the book is Needless Casualties of War by John Paul Jackson. And John Paul Jackson takes the position that we don't just, you know, go out attacking principalities and powers. He talks about a, a vision the Lord gave him of people getting mad and, and like howling at the moon and throwing hatchets at the moon. And the hatchets never got anywhere near the moon. In fact, they came back and hurt them. And he said, that's what much of our spiritual warfare is when we attack principalities and powers that are over our assigned area. Yet at the same time, Paul says, we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. One of the things that I hope we can accomplish is finding that balance of scripture. And I think there is a, I think there is a balance there. We do not indiscriminately go out and take on principalities and powers. I don't think that's wise. Um, our church has not participated in a couple of things that uh, wonderful people of prayer have sponsored here in South Carolina because I, as I prayed, I really felt that it was beyond our realm of authority and the Lord had not spoken to the church that we were to take on this battle. And it's not that we were cowards. It's not that we didn't want to participate. But we learn from Scripture. You guys with me here? Okay. Okay. We learn from Scripture that even the archangel, we talked about this Sunday, I think. Even the archangel, when he was battling uh, with the enemy over the body of Moses, and that's an interesting study in itself, um, it says that he did not bring a railing accusation against the devil. And what that means is that he did not bring a flippant or careless, literally a poorly thought out accusation against the devil, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. So we live in a world where as we grow in spiritual power, we're going to find that we don't take on every battle that we perceive as a battle. Remember, Jesus said, no man going to war goes to war without first counting the cost and being sure that uh, the war is winnable. Now, that's not a lack of faith. People will tell you that. But I'm telling you, Jesus told us to exercise cautious wisdom. And at the same time, while we've got to hear from him, we do need to understand that Paul said to the Ephesians, we do fight uh, not with flesh and blood. I started to say we do fight with flesh and blood. We do that, but we shouldn't do that. That's not where our battle is. <coughs> and he said that we are engaged in a battle against principalities and power. But I think the balance is found this way. We engage in battles with principalities and powers as the Lord directs us. And as anointing comes for us, but it's not, don't take this verse to just mean we have authority over everything. I think it might be shocking how much we need to understand the Lord has all authority and he gives delegated authority, but delegated authority is not a, a, a carte blanche where it's, it's just whatever you want to do, take it on. Um, so I interrupted myself. I'm, I'll hold you responsible. But the name of the book is Needless Casualties of War, John Paul Jackson. And I will go ahead and tell you now, you will not agree with everything, or, or probably will not agree with everything. But I think it's a good, balanced, cautionary statement for everybody that's going to be involved in spiritual warfare. If you are like me, you'll come through the book saying, I agree with this, 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 and this. I disagree with this and this, but it, it will bring wisdom to your intercession. I guarantee that. Needless casualties of war. Um, let's continue reading verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to, uh, done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, the second passage is 18 verses out of the book of Nehemiah. This is not an Old Testament lesson on, on the armor of God. It's a lesson from the Old Testament about how battles present themselves in which we need to use the armor of God. It's just, we, we could have taken any number of uh, probably 15 or 18 stories like this, but this is one that has some points of application I want to share with you. So Nehemiah 4, 1 to 18. Remember now when... <coughs> Excuse me, when um, Israel goes back out of captivity, they are sent back. The first thing that they do is to rebuild the temple. The second thing that they do uh, is to rebuild the walls of the city. The walls of the city were city's defenses. And old Jerusalem, now, cities in Bible times are like cities today. There's the city proper, and then there's environs that go out. Um, uh, but Old Jerusalem, you could put Old Jerusalem on our property here. Um, and, and that was the city. So you, it gives you an idea of the city proper. It was a, a, about 12 acres, um, depending... Oh, I don't want to go into that. Um, if, if we have some sites, right, it was about 12 acres, uh, what we called the old city proper that the walls were around. Now, obviously, it grew much larger than that. Uh, the Bible talks about in 2 Samuel about David building the city, and he built from this area, and he built from that area, and the city just really expands. If you go to Jerusalem today, those of you that have been there, you know Jerusalem is a magnificent city with all of these areas, but there's a relatively small space called the old city. And that's what they were rebuilding. Um, and this is typical of our lives. When, when we return to God through salvation, the first thing that is rebuilt is always the temple. It's always the dwelling place of God. Um, and that's the way it was in Jerusalem. The first thing they do is rebuild the temple. But even after the temple of God is rebuilt, the city walls need to be rebuilt. That's your personality. That's the restoration where the psalmist in Psalm 23 said, he restores my soul. So God not only comes into your heart and, and the moment you give your life to Jesus, God takes up residence in your life. That's the rebuilding of the temple. But then there becomes a, a process of the walls of your life being rebuilt. Some places of the walls are almost to the top. They were very, very uh, minimally affected. But other places in our lives, the walls are halfway down. And might be that several places in our life, the walls are just obliterated. They're just gone. And we need a total restoration. But that's what Nehemiah was after. Now, when Sanballat heard that the, uh, they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. Boy, this is the way the enemy talks to you when you begin to rebuild your life, even with the help of God. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. 
But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And there are so many sermon points here. It's so hard for me to just keep reading. But uh, I think you're picking up on them as we go through it. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted them behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did, the, did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Now let's just kind of introduce, today we're just going to talk about some general themes. In particular, there are four realities of the world of the armor of God and, and the idea of spiritual warfare. Um, I want you to notice this. When God's people set themselves to work, the hosts of hell set their minds to wreck. D don't be lulled into believing that once you become a Christian, that everything is going to just easily fall into place. There will be days when it does. There will be days when God does more without you even knowing about it than he does at other times. But there are also times when there will be active and obvious opposition to what you are doing. This is why Jesus taught us to watch and pray. Uh, I like what one pastor said, to pray without working is laziness. To work without praying is presumption. So let's look at these general themes. Here's the first one. They all start with the letter A, <coughs> just to help you maybe as you're outlining and doing some study. Now, this is based on the Ephesians passage. Um, the first thing we need to understand, if and, and, and guys, I, I keep talking about spiritual warfare, but you understand the, the armor of God is for the purpose of spiritual warfare. So I may go back and forth between those ideas, but they're, they're um, linked to each other. The first word is the word adversary. Um, we see it in verses 11 and 12. And uh, it's interesting the way that it's put. He said, um, uh, our struggle is, against flesh, uh, is not against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual uh, entities. And um, he says that, uh, you, as Peter put it Sunday, I'm, I'm going back and forth in my mind. Peter talked about your adversary, the devil. This is your adversary. This is a personal thing. Um, we notice some things about Satan. I just finished just a per, not for a s s sermons, but just for my own uh, Bible study. I just finished um, uh, a study in the book of Revelation. And it just seemed that the Lord to me in my study kept highlighting the power of the enemy. Not, not that we need to be fearful of it, but he, he wanted me to understand how uh, difficult it will be for people during that tribulation period to resist the enemy because he has such incredible power. Um, uh, the the uh, letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is what he says. He says, there will be such deception 
among those people that have rejected the gospel during the tribulation period. He said there will be such deception that they will be turned over to a lie, those that reject the truth. They will be turned over to a lie and believe, or, uh, and believe the lie of the Antichrist so that they are damned. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strong um, uh, adversary that we have. The first thing we see is that Satan is subtle. Um, he talks about the wiles of the devil and wiles is a use is, is a word that means the, the cunning devices, the cunning ploy, the cunning approach. Now, when Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail uh, against the church, the, the gates, most scholars, I think, or at least conservative scholars think that the gates of hell, it's not the picture of a gate that we're going to knock down. I mean, I think that will happen, um, spiritually speaking. But whenever you talked about the gates of a city, um, usually can, you, you have to determine it by the context. It can mean just the gates that keep people out. But uh, as often as not, the gates of the city, that's where the, the leaders met. It was called the gates of the city. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And um, in, in other words, he had become a policy maker. He had become a politician in the city of so Sodom. And I believe when Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now there's, there's plenty of passages where we say that the, the strongholds of, of the enemy will collapse. I believe that. But I think what Jesus was saying is that no plan of hell will stand successfully against the people of God. It's like the prophet that said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What hell plans will not be successful because Jesus is leading his church. But we need to understand that Satan is subtle. I was talking to someone a few years ago, nobody in this church, but this person had been in ministry and had, uh, was, was older than I am now. They, they were well along and uh, uh, in, in fact, had retired from their church and they ended up falling into uh, uh, a moral failure in their 70s. And as I talked to him, he had lost all kinds of things, not to mention his family and, uh, or, or his wife. And they were working through reconciliation. But he said, I don't understand. He said, I withstood greater temptation than this in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. How could this happen now? And I, I, he didn't need me to answer that question. He needed to work through that question. But I knew this, and I knew that he was going to have to wrap his head around this. Satan will, is so subtle that he will plant a seed that will take decades to germinate if we don't deal with that because he is subtle and there are things that can be in our midst if we're not careful in our lives if we're not careful uh, Satan is patient and he's subtle and I have found that uh, sometimes late in our life we end up falling to, to battles we thought we'd never have to face again like what Pastor Darren said and, and uh uh, by the way, Pastor Darren is, is doing really well. Um, if you have not heard, we didn't know Sunday. Um, they, have, they ruled out a stroke. Um, they said it was a seizure and uh, probably just the result of the brain surgery. But the chances of it recurring are very minimal. So we're, we thank the Lord for that. He's doing good. Uh, and I did have permission to, to share that. But um, Darren said something that I really think is full of wisdom. He said, no matter how far you, you've been down the road, you know, using the highway as a metaphor, no matter how far you've gone down the road, you're still only a few feet from the ditch. Whether you've been on the road a mile or 5,000 miles, you're still only a few, few feet from the ditch. So we have to understand that he is subtle. And we also need to understand that he is spiritual. That means he's not flesh and blood. That means he works in our thought life. He works in our emotions. Um, uh, for those of you that uh, may not understand the difference, uh, a, a generally accepted perspective is that we are a, a, a house of three rooms. 
just as the tabernacle was was the the outer court, the inner court, uh, and and the holiest of holies or the holy of holies. We have our outer court, which is our body. We have our inner court, which is our soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, our emotions. It's the non-physical part of us. Okay, my, my emotions are not physical. They can affect me physically, but it's the non-spiritual part of me. But then we also have a holy place. It's called our spirit. And it's our spirit that is born again. And it's our spirit that is eternal. Um, and Satan can attack on all three of those levels. Um, the third thing is that Satan, uh, he's not only subtle and spiritual, but he's strong. These words that are used like principalities and powers, these, uh, this is why this is a case for uh, Paul's example of the armor being based on, on a Roman soldier because those are, are words of the Roman Empire, principalities and powers. Um, in other words, we, we need to understand that, that God has defeated Satan, but state, Satan still has power. He's still the prince of this world. And uh, the, victory's, the victory is won, but the victory won't be completely manifested, uh, you know, until the battle is completed. Um, we, we need to understand that uh, any place that we're willing to traffic in darkness, it gives Satan permission to have some level of authority in our life. Now, that doesn't mean that he will take the authority. Um, I remember somebody asking Jack Deere, I've done all of these things, but I, I don't feel that I'm demonized. And Jack talked a little bit. He said, I think it's because you had a praying mother. I think a praying mother made all the difference in your life and her prayers kept you from the demonization that you could have experienced. And I, 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 I know the, the story and I know the person. I think Jack Deere was right. But I do know this as a general principle, anything that we open our heart to the enemy he has at least permission often to, uh, to traffic in that area. That's why we must not walk in unforgiveness and bitterness. That's why we can't walk in, in lust and greed and envy and these things because that's the domain of the enemy. And whenever we embrace those things, we embrace some measure of his working in our life. So he, he, is, um, he is strong. Now, I, I've got to say this. Um, I think think we're going to be able to, to deal with this as we work through these four weeks. There's a difference between authority and power. Uh, <clears throat> authority has to do with permission and rightful uh, uh, standing to do something. But power has to do with the means of carrying it out. So, you know, a lot of times we talk about our authority in Christ, and I think we should, but I think we also need to understand that it's not enough to just have authority. We need to pray for the manifestation of power. <coughs> I believe every Christian that's a true Christian has the authority to cast out devils. But not every Christian has learned to tap into that power to do that. And the power, just like the authority, has to come from the Lord. But we'll talk about that later. It flows bo both ways. Um, another thing that I picked up is that Satan is, is very sinister. I mean, he, he never has a good day. He never, he never is merciful. He never has days where he shows a moment of kindness. Everything that he does is darkness and evil. Now that's your adversary. He goes about as a lion, Peter would say, uh, eagerly desiring to devour. The second dynamic of spiritual warfare and the, and the armor of God is that we need to understand there's an armory. Um, there are some spiritual principles that Paul related to the weaponry, either of a Roman soldier or, uh, again, it may be connected to an Old Testament illusion. Uh, and, and those two may be combined. I, I, we don't know. We'll talk about that if we can. But uh, he begins by telling us, uh, about the belt of truth. Now, let your mind be on what these things represent rather than the pieces of the armor. He talked to us about a helmet. 
He, uh, he talked to us about a breastplate that would protect the front and back of the soldier. It went all the way around. He talked to us about a belt. And if we're talking about the Roman uh, armor, um, the belt is uh, pivotal because it held everything in place. And when it was time for a soldier to run, he had a, a system very simple but very powerful and beautiful system of hooks and, and snaps so that everything could be pulled up and, and attached to the belt. And he was able to run and move and, and, uh, and maneuver because of the belt holding everything in place. Um, there were also shoes he talked about, then a, then a, a shield, and then a sword. Um, the belt represents truth. Now, our emphasis is don't get caught up with the idea of a belt. Understand that truth is necessary for spiritual warfare. I do think it's significant that uh, the belt holds everything together. And I think that's a lesson for us. It, it doesn't matter what anointings you have. It doesn't matter what faith you have. It doesn't matter what scriptures you've memorized. <coughs> if they're not all anchored to truth, uh, uh, um, it, it's, it's got to be anchored to proper interpretation. Um, I think it was William Perkin, a great Puritan writer and preacher that said, never believe the devil, even when he tells the truth. So he, what Paul was saying is that everything God does not only has to be effective, but it has to be anchored to truth and truth needs to be connected to all of these other spiritual dynamics. So the first thing he wants you to have to fight the enemy is truth. Uh, truth is what sets us free. Jesus said, and uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. The, the apostle said that there are those who wrestle the scriptures to their own destruction. Uh, you can take something as powerful and beautiful as the word of God, and it can be destructive to you if you don't allow truth to prevail in the application of, of that truth. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm amused by people that uh, really crush other Christians with their point of view by saying things like, well, that's not what it says in the original. If you knew what the Greek said, or if you knew what the Hebrew said. And um, I, I, that's interesting to me because people that read the original Greek and Hebrew, we find out in the Old and New Testament that they twisted the scripture. So it's not a matter of, of, of knowing the intricacies of a Greek noun or a, or a, or a Hebrew verb or word of action. It's, it's not a matter of that because it's not a matter of knowing a language. It's a matter of knowing the scripture, of knowing truth. Well, uh, there's the breastplate of righteousness. So God's interested in me walking in truth. He's interested in me walking in righteousness. Now, righteousness represents two things. Righteousness is my position in Christ. Everything that I do is because I realize I have the righteousness of God in Christ. I am not righteous through my own efforts. I'm righteous because of his effort. I'm righteous because of his work. So righteousness is how I stand. I stand in the presence of God declared righteous because my faith is in Christ. But there's another dynamic of righteousness. Righteousness is not just where I stand. Righteousness is how I live. So I stand in the righteousness of Christ, but I should live in obedience to the word and in purity of soul. So righteousness is both something that I, I receive and it's something that I live out. It's definitely a two-edged uh, two sword, two-sided kind of, kind of coin. Uh, so he wants me to have truth. He wants me to have righteousness and he wants me to have peace. The shoes are very, it's a, it's a very, you know, stilted, tough translation from Greek to, to, to English. English is a, is a, is a tough translation. And you read that and you say the, the shoes are the readiness of the gospel, right? You know, you, you don't understand what that means easily in English, but basically what it's saying is the shoes give you standing and stability and mobility, but the, the, the result of having the shoes is peace 
or steadiness. Um, the shoes, now there's, you could look at them from a couple of ways. They, they give you st uh, standing on, on slippery ground. They give you traction to make progress. But the end result of the shoes is that you live in peace and you live in confidence and you know that God is going to, you know, he who began the good work in you is faithful to complete it. Uh, shoes represent peace. So I walk in truth, I walk in righteousness, and I also walk in peace. And peace is absolutely indispensable for spiritual victory. Then he moves to the shield of faith. <coughs> and um, he says, with faith, we will be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And I think basically what this says, faith, faith is like righteousness. It's both a gift and a characteristic of life. I, I receive faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God. But I also must have faith. I must learn to believe the report of the Lord and not the report of my flesh or the report of the enemy. So we have the shield of faith. Then we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it's interesting that in one hand you have the word, the other hand you have the shield of faith. And that tells us that the word, and this, this is what the New Testament teaches us, the word must always be mixed with faith. It must always be mixed with faith. To understand the word and make it effective, we must have faith. And to have faith and make it effective, it must come out of the word. Um, then he talks finally about the helmet of salvation. In another passage of scripture, it's called the, the, the helmet of, of salvation or the helmet of the hope of salvation. And um, some say that this helmet of salvation speaks of salvation in general. In other words, the crowning piece of the armor is that we are saved. Others believe that this speaks of the transformation that results from the renewing of our mind. But I think in, in actuality, it probably speaks of both. The helmet of the hope of salvation, I think it focuses on a couple of things. But I think basically it, it focuses on process. When you see the word hope, Remember, we've talked about this. It's not a, I hope so. You know, I, it's not, I hope I have salvation. It's confidence in a process. And the helmet of salvation is the understanding that everything I've committed to him, he's able to keep. He who began a good work in me will be faithful to bring it to completion. I, I am not what I am going to be, but I'm not what I used to be either. I am a work in progress and I am a new creation. Okay, now that's our armory. That's a, that's a pretty substantial uh, uh, set of weapons for us to walk with. It protects us. It gives us the, the understanding that no matter how bad the battle is, we win because we have the hope of salvation. It tells me that I, I, I don't need to worry about trying to be uh, or do something to make God love me more because there's nothing I can do to make him love me more. There's nothing I will do that will make him love me less. I have his righteousness. My life is guided by his truth and his peace directs my every step. And I have this, the word mixed with faith and I defeat the fiery darts of the enemy because the, the, the word that is in my heart produces faith in my heart. Um, and I, and I'll say this, uh, that leads to the third word is the word atmosphere. When you read about the armor of God, he closes it by shifting into something that we forget about. Whenever we do the teaching on the armor, we usually forget about this. He says, but all of this is to produce a life that is full of prayer, that is led by the spirit. So spiritual warfare is by the spirit's enabling. One of the lessons is about being led by the spirit. Um, and we need to understand that it is the Spirit's enabling that gives us victory. He also gives us a sense of family, and it turns our focus, our attention on prayer. Um, Exodus 17, the fight against Amalek. Um, Moses was helped by Aaron and Hur. You remember Joshua fought the battle. Moses was interceding. This is the power of praying. 
in the spirit. And the battle went on so long that Moses began to get weary. And it says, as long as Moses held his hands up, Israel prevailed. But when his hands came down, uh, Israel began to lose. And that seems so odd, but God was teaching us something. And Aaron got on one side and her got on the other and held his arms up. And I think that's a beautiful picture of intercessory prayer. Uh, but that's not where we're, we're going tonight. I remember one of my kids, uh, we, we, we studied this in devotion one time and, and, uh, I said, what, what were the, what were the men's names that helped Moses pray? And one of my kids said, Aaron and she, and, and I thought Aaron and her, Aaron and she, that's pretty close. Okay. Uh, Daniel 10, Daniel found out that he was waiting on God for three weeks, 21 days, and he kept thinking, why can't I get through? Why can't I get through? And then when the angel came with the answer, he said, Daniel, you, your prayer was heard the first day, but there was spiritual warfare that was going on. Um, we're going to be talking this Sunday about uh, how to understand those moments when prayer seems to be unanswered. And one of the things we'll talk about is that sometimes there's just spiritual opposition to your praying. And it's not, it's not that God's not faithful. It's not that you're not faithful to pray, but there's a battle going on you know nothing about. But as we wear the armor of God, we are led and energized by the Spirit and He helps us. Now here's the last uh, word I want to give you. <coughs> Excuse me, then we'll wrap it up with our life lessons. Um, it's the word attack. Okay. Now we have an adversary that is very, uh, deceitful and cunning and strong, but God promised that his weapons won't work and no plan of hell will, will succeed. Uh, then there is an armory that we draw on, which we fight, um, the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, all energized by the spirit. There's an atmosphere that we need to understand that every thing that has to do with spiritual warfare or wearing the army uh, armor must be energized by the Holy Spirit. The armor does not work by the strength of your personality. The armor does not work by the strength of your discipline. It works by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. The last word is the word attack. We, we need to understand that if we have the armor of God, we are expected to be on the offensive. And we also need to understand there are going to be times that we take a defensive posturing. Um, uh, I know we don't like the idea of being on the defensive, but let's face it. Sometimes you're under attack and you all know what it's like to feel that if God doesn't help me survive this, I'm not going to survive it. it we, there, that's the reality of life. Sometimes we are on the defensive, but we, we don't want to take the uh, approach that says, well, sometimes we're on the defense and then when we're not being attacked, we can rest. I believe there are three seasons in spiritual warfare. I believe that there is the season of being attacked. I believe there's the season of rest because you, it, it, a soldier can't fight all the time. They have to sleep. They have to rest. They have to eat. But the third is there are times we're on the attack. We are the aggressor in, in a good sense of the term. So we've got to understand that just as a gun can be used as an offensive or a defensive weapon, you know, we, we need to understand that spiritual warfare involves times that we are attacking. It involves times that we're standing in the Lord and letting him protect us from attacks. But we, we, this is the point I'm trying to make. I don't think spiritual warfare means you're fighting every moment of every day. I really don't. I don't, I think that's as, that's as sure a way to get worn out as any I know of. Uh, but we do need to understand that attacks are normal and assignments are normal. And as we go through this study of the armor, God will help us understand it. Now, what are the, what are the Christian life lessons? Um, there are three. I just want to leave you with them. Uh, what page are, you, are we on right now? On page three, four? Okay. Okay. Uh, 
the first thing I want you to understand is that prayer is warfare. Uh, I, I think, I think, uh, I think the basic warfare of a child of God is overlooked. Uh, I think living right is warfare. When I do the right thing, I'm waging war against hell. Um, opposite behavior is warfare. That's why God said when someone does you wrong, do good to them. Someone curses you, bless them. Uh, spiritual warfare, uh, or excuse me, opposite behavior is one of the most powerful weapons of spiritual warfare I know. Um, I, I, I do think uh, also, I, I want to say this the right way, I do believe that there are prophetic acts and, and, and spiritual actions that we take that are symbolic of something that's going on in the spiritual realm. But I, but I think one of the problems, and I think this is what uh, John Paul Jackson points out in his book, I think one of the problems that we have in Pentecostal charismatic churches today is that we, we have been drawn to strange behavior. Now, I, don't get me wrong. God's not afraid of strange behavior. Uh, march around the city and don't make any noise. And then on the last day, shout. God, God's not, he has no problem with strange behavior. Fill the jars up with water all the way to the brim. And, uh, you, you know, and that seems strange because they had run out of wine, not out of water. There's nothing wrong with strange behavior. God doesn't mind. Some of the, you know, read the book of Ezekiel. And that is a book so full of mysticism and strange behavior that, it, you know, it, it, it can give you a headache if you, if you don't let the Lord speak to you through it. But I think we in our Pentecostal and charismatic churches have made the mistake of going straight to the strange and, and we're not understood because the only thing that we do are strange. Uh, but I think if we would just be consistent in our praying, that would win a lot of battles. If we would exercise opposite behavior, if we would be kind to those that are not kind, that would win so many battles. And then you've earned the right to strange behavior when it's time for that. Uh, but prayer is warfare. Number two, uh, I want you to pray in the spirit. Now, when we get to the lead on the spirit lesson, which I th think is the third one, um, we're going to talk about this in detail. But what does it mean to pray in the spirit? You might say, well, it's Pentecostals. And I believe this. Well, praying in the spirit is praying in tongues. I do believe in praying in tongues. I believe that uh, that's a very important part of praying in the spirit. But I think it means more than that. Um, I think to pray in the spirit... <laughs> It may be in tongues. In fact, I think praying in the Spirit, there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be in tongues, except um, there, you can pray in the Spirit in tongues. You may pray in the Spirit in your native language because whenever we're praying in the Spirit, it means that we pray with the Spirit's direction. I, I pray in tongues, I, I, I think, every day. I mean, I don't have a chart that I check it off, but I think I pray in the Spirit. I pray in tongues every day. But there are also times that I pray in English and I think that's every bit as much praying in the spirit because what's happened is God has given me a direction. He's given me an insight. I realize this is what I need to pray for. And I didn't realize that five minutes earlier. It was, it was a revelation to me. So we pray with the spirit's direction. We pray with the spirit's information. We all know what it's like to be praying for someone. And then the Lord say, pray this way. This is the problem. This is the difficulty. I, I remember the first time that happened to me. I, I knew what it was like to be led, you know, in, in pray by a burden and things like that. But I remember um, I, I was in college the first time this happened to me. And uh, I'd been down in the prayer room and I walked upstairs and uh, one of the guys on my hall, a friend of mine, said, hey, I want to talk to you. He said, I just, I'm just having a tough time and I need you to pray for me. And, uh, you know, we were, we were friends, we were 19, 20 year old buddies, you know, um, but I realized after about three minutes, he was just going in circles 
Oh, I've just got this need. I've got this burden. I've got these questions. And I, I, I no more knew what he needed me to pray for uh, when he finished talking than when we began. And I remember the first time in my life I looked at him and, and uh, he was still saying these general things. And the Lord said, this is his problem. This is the last time it happened. And he doesn't believe he can be set free. And uh, so I began to talk to him. I said, well, let me give you an example. And I used what he did as an example. And uh, I, I was able to, to, to speak very specifically to it and pray very specifically. And the Holy Spirit came on him. He was just shaking and trembling. He was praying. And later he gave a testimony. He said, I was so ashamed of my failure that I didn't want to talk to anybody about my failure, but I wanted out of the failure cycle. And he said, I went and talked to a friend and he was talking about our encounter. He said, it was like God spoke to him and told him what I did and when I did it and how I felt. And he said, he prayed so specifically that God set me free in that dormitory hallway where we were praying. Well, I think that's praying in the spirit. I had no idea, but the spirit gave me information. The spirit will give you direction. The spirit also has to give you anointing. Um, the, the difference between victory and no victory is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And uh, then, as I said, I, I'm, I'm all for praying in tongues, for praying with the Spirit's utterance. Okay, here's the final lesson. This is where we'll stop tonight. Um, it seems out of place, but it'll, it'll become more apparent why we want to mention this. In spiritual warfare, angels are often assigned to our battles. I think um, we're, we're just learning this. But I think about Mark 1 where it says that when Jesus was going through his difficulty that angels came and ministered to him. I think about Acts 12, 7 where Peter was delivered from death row. I think about Hebrews where it describes angels as ministering spirits. And I think about 2 Kings 6 when Elisha was at Dothan. He was surrounded by the army of Syria. But through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he and his servant saw that they were surrounded by the army, but the army was surrounded by the army of heaven, uh, of angels. So um, let me say this as Justin gets ready to come in and pray in these last 10 minutes or so here. <coughs> I do believe with all of my heart that we really are entering a new era. And I think everybody says that when they just want to encourage people to, to stretch. But I think we are entering an era, uh, it would take me 20 minutes to explain why, but I think we're entering an era where we are really entering a new level of spiritual discernment and activity. Um, I think in the past few weeks, I have seen more in the spirit in, in the last, I say maybe three months than I've seen in the past three years. Um, and I think God is, is about to, um, I think he's about to pull back the veil and let us see more of what is really going on in the spirit. But it's important that we be equipped with the armor of God. Okay. If you don't know Jesus, come ahead, Justin. If you don't know Jesus, Pastor Justin, when he's through leading in prayer, will tell you how to pray or how to get information about following him. If you're listening online, please call the number and uh, we'll be glad to provide someone to pray with you, help you follow the Lord. I love you. And next week we will uh, talk about the daily routine of spiritual warfare in connection with the armor of God. Justin. Thank you.